Hey, kia ora koutou no. Welcome back to another edition of Big Hairy News. Bit of a special for you tonight. If you're with us last night, you will be aware that we are not here tonight in an official capacity. As uh, thanks to many generous people last Friday night when we had Byron C. Clark on, uh, many of you decided to uh, contribute to our Super Chat option. And I promise that any Super Chats that came in would be getting spent on a catch-up with Byron when we could, which we are probably doing right now as you are watching this. However, I've also uh, given, asked you actually, asked a lot of people who were here last night, asked uh, of you if you would like to see in full a conversation that I had a couple of years ago with Professor Stephen Lewandowski. Now, I talk about Professor Stephen Lewandowski's research a fair bit. I talk about motivated cognition. I talk about the um, the connection that he has made with climate change deniers and the free market. And when I talked to him a couple of years ago, it was really based around the fact that that was quite a hot button time for um, conspiracy theories around COVID. So even though a lot of his research is done in climate change, I thought it's pretty much directly comparable and transferable to climate change versus COVID stuff as well. Anyway. So I finally played a proper little clip from his uh, show last night, a five minute clip. And I said, do you guys want to see that tonight? And I said, if you want to see that tonight, we're not going to be here live. I'll happily upload a show and play it out as live. And you guys can watch along with it if you want. And a huge number of people said, yes, please. We'd like to see that. And it's full. So that's what we're going to do. So uh, Professor Stephen Lewandowski is an Australian psychologist. He has worked in both the US and Australia and is currently based at the University of Bristol. University of Bristol is where I spoke to him, except at the time I spoke to him, I, from memory, I think he was in Germany on a research trip, but he was working at the University of Bristol when I spoke to him, but he was currently in Germany. Uh, he is the chair of the Cognitive Psychology of School of Psychological Science. His research, which originated, pertained to computer simulations of people's decision-making process recently is focused on the public understanding of science and why people often embrace beliefs that are sharply at odds with scientific evidence. So why, when the science says, for example, uh, tobacco causes cancer, are there still some people who go, no, it doesn't? Specifically, when we were talking to uh, Professor Stephen Lodowski, it was about this, climate change and conspiracy theory. So this was the basis of the conversation you're about to see. In 2012, Lewandowski put forward that uh, would later become one of the best known studies regarding public opinion on climate change. The survey examined data from more than 1,000 readers of climate science blogs taken from online questionnaires and posted there. Lewandowski approached five climate skeptic blogs to ask them to post the questionnaire, but they all declined to do so. Hmm, interesting. Um, the study was accepted by the psychological uh, by psychological science on in 2012, and published in the May of 2013 issue of the journal, which was titled "NASA Faked the Moon Landing, Therefore Climate Science is a Hoax." Uh, based on the survey of visitors to global warming related blogs, Lewandowski and his two co-authors concluded that belief in the free and free market economics was associated with being more likely to reject not only mainstream scientific view of global warming, but also the mainstream scientific view on whether HIV caused AIDS, whether tobacco caused lung cancer. And I guess you would now say, looking at the research around COVID and mask wearing and vaccines, that I imagine if it was done today, it would also point to those people as well. The study also concluded that believing in a cluster of conspiracy theories, such as the FBI was responsible for assassinating Martin Luther King, was associated with being more likely to reject the consensus view on global warming. So there was the reason that I spoke to Professor Lewandowski, which is primarily around the COVID conspiracies. But as you will be aware, currently in New Zealand, there is some conversations going on again around climate change and what various national party MPs might think about that. So it seems to me to be a perfect time to re-up. This conversation is currently online, but I'm putting it on again, so it'll be on twice on my own page. Um, to re-up this conversation, you guys said last night that you wanted it, so we are going to play it. Before we do play it, though, let me just say, uh, as always, a huge thanks to our patrons, uh, patreon.com forward slash big hairy news, if you want to be a part of what we do, if you want to help what we do, and uh, if you do, we would love you forever, and as Chewy always says, if you do, you will instantly become 22% more attractive. Uh, there are several layers or levels of um, 
support you can give us. It, it really genuinely makes a difference. I know you can see our Patreon page. It might only say to you 400 bucks a month, but 400 bucks a month pays for internet. You know, I had to install a, a $600 card in my um, in my computer the other day to help the graphics. You know, patrons paid for that. It took a couple of months, but patrons paid for it. So literally and honestly, every five bucks makes a huge difference. We really genuinely appreciate you guys being on board. And if you are on board, a reminder that this Saturday at uh, 11 a.m. New Zealand time, there is a patrons catch up should you want to be involved. It's online. Your invite will already be in your inbox to join a Zoom meeting. If you're not a patron and you'd like to get involved and help out with what we do, then uh, you can sign up before uh, Friday midnight and you'll get a link to that meeting as well. And we might see you on Saturday morning. All right, team, that's it for now. Uh, thanks again for joining us on Friday night and helping us uh, for want of a better word, bless uh, Byron with a night out tonight. Um, and thank you for being on board tonight to check out this replay of my conversation. For my other podcast, so don't get confused that all the imagery is going to look different, but for my other podcast, when I was 50 kilos heavier, as an aside, and I didn't have the shelf on the back wall, so it looks, and I had a sponsor. Um, I, I was sitting over here on the back wall, so you can ignore all that because it's a vaping product, and apparently that's bad to advertise now. Um, but we will be back on Monday night and uh, we appreciate you all and enjoy Stephen Lewandowski. If people who have been listening to this podcast of mine will know over the past four or five episodes, this has been the thing I've been looking forward to most of all. So I am so genuinely grateful that you've chosen to come on board and have a chat with us. And I'm so very excited about having a chat to you about uh, who you are and what you do and one of the areas of research that you, um, do you say specialize in or is it just an area of interest for research for you? Well, both. I'm interested in it, but I also specialize in it, yeah. So um, you are a psychologist, and I'm assuming that means the psychology department of Bristol, is that, that the department you're a professor in? Yeah, you're right about the department. I'm in the department of uh, psychology, or what, whatever it's called now. Um, in terms of training, I'm actually a cognitive scientist. I consider myself to be a cognitive scientist, not a psychologist. And the difference is that cognitive science is more interdisciplinary. And if you look at the kind of work I do, you know, you'll find that there's a lot of computer science in it. There's a lot of philosophy also in it. Occasionally I've published in philosophy journals, for example. And um, so I don't just do psychology to understand how the mind works. I also do computer modeling and I think about the, you know, philosophical issues that are involved, which is actually very important in the context of uh, understanding science denial or why people reject science and why we can say that that is probably not such a good way to understand reality. So you've, you've jumped straight into it to let people know this area of interest that we're talking about is I'm going to paraphrase it and then I'll probably butcher it and then you can clean it all up. <laughs> so um, I read about you and found out about you and the way I interpret as a, uh, as a caveman which is my area of speciality, um, what you do is your your area of interest and research is, t I kind of look at it as twofold, and you can, again, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm slightly skewed, when people just won't believe the science, that's one of the areas you look into. But I think even more interestingly, as I read it, when someone has a belief or a uh, they have a thought process that, be that, that believes something and when they're presented with the scientific evidence that shows that they're wrong and it's maybe the opposite of you or a different view as the truth, they still, they still choose to stick with the belief rather than go, oh, the, the, the science says this, so I need to change my beliefs. And one of the reasons I'm excited about this, and I, I said this to you before you go, before we started, and people who watch and listen to me understand that I have a bit of an affinity with the flat earthers. And no matter what you show them, they hang on to their beliefs. But in this current climate, uh, especially with what's happening in America and, and here in New Zealand and around the world with people like uh, not taking on board the need to wear masks and what COVID really is. I just think this is the most pertinent conversation at the most pertinent yeah. time possibly we're ever going to have on this podcast. So there I'm, I'm, you can hear I'm excited. So have I got the, the, the research interest basically right? What do we need to tweak yes. to explain to people what you yeah, do? Yeah, no, spot on, spot on. 
So tell us, I mean, wh- why why does that happen? Why don't why do people, when given uh, unchallengeable scientific truths and proofs, still choose to stick with their beliefs? Well, first of all, I got to correct you on that one uh, because science doesn't offer proof; it okay. offers evidence. Okay, okay, okay. And um, I think that's very important to 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 be aware of that because, intriguingly, one of the interesting techniques of people who reject scientific evidence is to ask for proof. Um, they're, they're, that's one of their techniques is to say, well, can you prove to me that climate change exists? And the answer to that is, well, no, of course not. It's not a matter of proof. It's a matter of evidence. There is no proof outside of mathematics. So, um, and it's kind of important to get that right because otherwise, you know, when, when a climate denier, quote unquote, says, oh, I want proof, then one, you know, you might be tempted to try and give it to them. Well, you can't. And that is where they're wrong to begin with, because by asking for, for proof, they're already basically disqualifying themselves from a, from a scientific debate, because in science, the best you can do is to produce evidence and pile evidence on top of evidence on top of evidence. And then ultimately you get to the point where we, we say that something is a fact, um, such as climate change, for example, where the evidence is so overwhelming that uh, not accepting it is is just not a rational position to take. Um, now, when I say rational, I, I what I mean by that is rational in the very strict sense of how philosophers have worked out that we should consider evidence. Um, and so the question then is, as as you already asked, why do people not? accept the evidence what is it that makes them say oh no 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 (laughs) i want proof even though there is a pile of evidence uh in front of their eyes and the answer is that instead of engaging in this quote unquote rational evidence accumulation process people resort to what we call motivated cognition now motivated cognition is a very broad term And it refers to the idea that people start out with a goal in their head of what they're trying to to conclude. And they will then draw that conclusion. They'll be motivated to draw that conclusion no matter what the evidence says. Right. And now the question is, okay, what makes people engage in motivated cognition? And that's where things get to be very interesting because there's a lot of ways in which that can happen. In the context of climate change, and indeed in in most situations I've looked at, um, what triggers people's motivated cognition is the conflict between their personal worldview and the scientific evidence. So basically, it's ideology versus evidence. And that is why... Um, when you look at climate denial around the world, it doesn't really matter where you go, although it's most pronounced in Australia, the UK, and the US, what you find is that what determines people's attitudes towards climate change uh, is their attitudes towards the free market. If they're libertarian or free market fundamentalists or conservatives who think that you know business should be laissez-faire, free enterprise, you know, that cluster of attitudes, if people subscribe to that strongly, then chances are uh, that they will reject the evidence from climate change. I can ask people four or five questions about the free market. And once I know their answers, my uncertainty about their climate change belief is is cut in half. Right. Which is incredible. Right. So you can so you can you can you can probe them in a different area and say, well, because they've answered this here, you know, like Precisely. a free market economy, they're likely to believe this here. Precisely. Wow. Precisely. And the association is incredibly strong. And if you think about it, that's not surprising <laughs> because if you accept the scientific evidence about climate change, then we're going to have to do something uh, and, and change the way we do business. And that means we got to put a price on carbon. We might need taxes regulations there might be some you know uh, some industries like the coal industry for example you know is going to go out of business uh, there's no question 
Um, so there'll be a massive transformation of the economy in ways that are not compatible with, with the sort of fundamentalist approach to free market economics. And so you have that conflict. And some people's identity is so tied up in their free market beliefs that they get incredibly challenged by the claims that the climate is changing, that we have to do something about it. And it becomes a, a very deep emotional response. And their way of defending their identity against that is, is by simply denying the science. They just say, well, you haven't proven it to me. <laughs> you know, there's no proof. Hence, I can walk away from it. For example, there's lots of other ways in which they do it. But, but the motivating factor is ideology. Do you think that um, I, I was going to say we're splitting hairs? I don't mean we're splitting hairs in a. In a, in a I'm not trying to undermine anything, but because you're coming from an academic um, position, the idea of evidence and proof, whereas for most of us laymen, when we say where's the proof, we're kind of saying where's the evidence, even though we might be using the wrong words. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yes, and that's fine. And and you know, but but if you're asking me about proof, then yeah. I have to clarify that you know that's not really what it's about. I mean. Proof is something that's inescapable for logical reasons. That's what a proof is. You know, it's it's like in maths. You know, you can you can prove something, but in the real world, it's all about having evidence. And yes, the evidence can be so strong that it would be perverse not to believe it. That is actually Stephen Jay Gould uh, coined that term. He he said a fact is something that is so well established that it would be perverse to withhold. Uh, at least provisional assent to, to that fact. So, um, but, you know, we always have to understand that, that there are degrees of evidence and that our knowledge, some knowledge is, is rock solid, but gravity, you know, we, we don't debate gravity. Um, you'd be surprised. Well, we also don't debate that the earth is round. Well, you'd be surprised again by some. the fact that there are some people who, who are in, in a different space uh, when it comes to that. But, you know, the point is that you know, there's no scientific uncertainty about that. And actually, there's none about climate change either. We know it's happening and we know that we're causing it and it's not going to be all good. So those three facts are, are actually not under dispute scientifically. So would it be fair to kind of assert you've talked about mathematics? I mean, it's easy to prove that two plus two is four. Um, but once once something becomes unquestionable like there has to be an absolute to be proof is that what you're saying and if there's if there's one yeah. tenth of one percent of a, an idea of you know possibly a different outcome then we stick with the idea of mounting evidence rather than the term proof yeah i mean you know the fact that the earth is round is not a matter of proof it's it's i mean you know it's a matter of evidence um and the fact that the earth is revolving around the sun is is you know it's it's not something I can prove. It is just something where I, you know, all the evidence tells us that. And, um, you know, in certain cases, very many cases, actually, the strength of evidence is such that it is indistinguishable, almost, from a mathematical proof, right, right, you know, right. such as that the Earth is flat, and, yeah. uh, not <laughs> round, rather, and uh, that there is gravity and, and the planetary motions. I mean, you know, that stuff we, we don't debate. It's kind of like, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, and, and no one disputes it because it's a waste of time. Um, the, you used the phrase before, and I'm, I'm scribing away down here as you're talking. Uh, the, yeah. One of the reasons, and again, I'm going to obviously be a caveman layman here, but talking about one of the reasons people hold on to their beliefs uh, rather than go with the science, the evidence is uh, motivated cognition. As you're saying that, I'm thinking uh, that sort of sounds like what some layman might say. You know, a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, we it's it's like uh, it's like we want to see well, it, so we make it happen and we stick with it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of components to this. You know, the fundamental principle is that people think to achieve an, an outcome rather than. Uh, follow the evidence. That, that's, that's, the, that's what motivated cognition means. And so that means that it doesn't matter what evidence you present to somebody who's committed to the position, for example, that climate change doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what you would, you know, if, if they're not satisfied yet by the evidence that exists, then they never will be. It's a complete, you know, there, there, there's no connection between their thinking and the, the state of the evidence. Um, 
and and that of course is is deeply problematic if that then translates into political currency into political movements that are uh, blocking mitigation efforts for climate change so so we can't just walk away from this and say oh well you know some people just don't believe it well once it turns into a political force then it is much harder to 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 ignore that and that's when we have to start understanding why this happens and we we then have to uh, try and find ways uh, of of dealing with that. I guess as well, when you're talking about, and you were talking about those who uh, believe in the free market, or I guess who believe in it more fervently, are more fervently likely to be climate um, climate change yeah. deniers. Um, I guess that therefore you can also politically say, well, obviously people who believe in that style of economics are also right wingers. Therefore, right wingers are more likely. To, uh, to disregard climate change. And although that might spread the group, and there are people like within the American, I'm sorry, the New Zealand right that they call blue greens who accept the science of climate change, but but they're still, it's like it's like 100% of the people who are libertarians are on the right. So it's easier then to look at all of the right and go, well, you are the guys who don't accept climate change and look at the left, and I'm talking politically speaking, and go, you are the guys yeah. who do. So you get bigger uh, bigger groups to then label with that same yeah. uh, disbelief. Uh, you're 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 right. I mean, I can substitute my free market questions with uh, an inventory of people's political attitudes, and if I then separate them into liberals versus conservatives or whatever the distinction in Australia, that doesn't work too well because uh, the Liberal Party in Australia is actually conservative. So you got to be careful. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> the the left right division, you, you get the same results uh, because, yeah, there's a strong association between conservatism and endorsement of free markets. And, um, and, and so you have this conflict in, in, in that case. And, and what's interesting is that that sort of association between politics and science denial is surprisingly widespread. Um, for example, if you look at attitudes towards vaccinations, uh, you get the same result. People on the political right, at least in the United States, are less likely to endorse vaccinations than people on the political left. Um, and, and if you look at why that is, then you very quickly run into the same idea, namely libertarianism, and the idea that the government shouldn't control what happens to my children, or that the government shouldn't tell me how to lead my life. And Hence, vaccinations are being rejected because they're seen as a an intrusion into uh, parental autonomy. Although, although in that one, I'm interested because obviously you've you've done the work. I think about the political spectrum, maybe not being so much of a linear, but more, you know. Yeah, yeah, like a horseshoe. Yeah, and I and I think of the people I know who reject vaccinations. I hear what you're saying about the, the the libertarian on the right, but also the far left, when people are like, I don't put aluminium in my body and these sorts of things. Yeah. It seems that for that particular, shall we call it a conspiracy theory or a position or opinion, that the far left and the far right can kind of hold mm. equal footing in that. Um, from the research yeah. that, that you've looked at or, or what you've looked into, is, well, is it an even spread or is it more still more well, on the far right than the far left? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, because I think anecdotally, you're absolutely right. And in fact, right now, um, when you look at COVID and you're looking at these demonstrations around the world against masks or against God knows, you know, social distancing and all that, people who say COVID is a hoax, that, that's a very eclectic, interesting mix of people yeah. who, who uh, can be from the extreme left uh, as well as from the extreme right. Um, now, so, so yes, the extremes might mingle up on, on these occasions. But what's interesting is that in the data, when, when I take, you know, a thousand Americans or, or U.S. residents, and I look at their attitudes and I, I try to find out how they uh, respond to scientific evidence, then in, in those samples, those representative large samples, those extreme left people just don't show up uh, because there are hardly any of them. So right. you, you don't sweep okay. up a lot of extreme leftists if you get a thousand representative Americans. You might get one or two, but you will sweep up about a hundred or so uh, extreme right wingers in in a representative sample in the U.S. of of a thousand. You know, I mean, there there is a very large uh, right wing tail in the United States, so they will 
be in my samples, uh, as they should be, because they actually are numerically greater, larger than the extreme left. Um, and, and, and that's why then, you know, everything is, the, the result is that the right wing, the extreme right wing is denying climate change and is reluctant about vaccinations. And God knows, you know, the link between tobacco and, and lung cancer, you know, there's a lot of scientific issues that I've looked at and other colleagues have looked at where the extreme right is less likely to endorse the science than people on the left. And, and yeah, sure, there may be some, a handful of extreme leftists who show up at the same demonstrations as, as the right wingers, but um, there, there aren't enough to actually show up in the data when you, when you do a systematic survey. So, um, so you have to be very careful about, this is actually an interesting scientific point, you have to be very careful about whether you go with the sort of anecdotes, the appearance of left wingers at demonstrations, or whether you go with uh, with the data. And especially in the context of vaccination, that's been very interesting because there was a time when very reputable journalists, in fact, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Chris Mooney, made claims uh, that vaccine denial was the climate denial of the left based on right. appearance, based right. on the fact that some of the spokespeople were sort of left wingish, um, but it doesn't show up in the data. So, so you have to be very careful about not mistaking anecdotes, individual people who you can listen to or who you see at demonstrations to mistake that for what is really happening in the population. Because the only way you can understand that is by sampling representative samples and look at what people uh, believe i also i also think you 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 are saying anecdotal i mean when i hear that i think like a an individual's experience versus what the data or data says so so to speak um uh, yeah. there are unquestionably i guess though still those on the far left for the vaccine one in oh. particular sure but i also wonder if it's still a mindset of why they fight against that, and I wonder if the libertarians on the right fight against it, as you're saying, like, you know, keep the government out of my parenting decision, small government, you know, I'm not going to do what you tell me to, especially in the American system, whereas those on the far left are more about, um, from their perspective, I, I know, and this is just me saying from people I know in that thing, it's more about them and their own health and what they do want to do to their own body. So it seems like maybe the right, when they fight against that one, would be more an institutional a battle, whereas the far left about that particular one, they're more doing it from an uh, ironically individual liberties kind of position, uh, perhaps. Quite, um, quite, quite possibly. Yeah, yes, quite possibly. Um, the other thing we have to talk about if we talk about science denial is conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. because um, you know you scratch the surface a little uh, when you talk to somebody who who is rejecting well-established scientific facts. And, and you'll find a conspiracy theorist sooner or later. You know, I mean, I can almost promise you that. You, you, you just, you know, spend a few minutes, kind of ask a few questions, and ultimately you get to the conspiracy very quickly. Um, and, and that is, is important to understand because um, dealing with people who believe in conspiracy theories is, is challenging because by definition, uh, a conspiracy theory is a self-sealing edifice. In other words, a conspiracy theory is designed to, to turn any contrary evidence into evidence for the theory, as well as the absence of evidence, uh, turning that into evidence for the conspiracy theory. So by the time you get to your conspiracy theory, you, you, got, a, you got a completely closed bubble sort of like a Mr. Beanish uh, epistemic bubble where, where there's only one person inside or one theory and everything else finds no admission. Um, and, and that's important to understand. And I think it is illustrative for others who, who do not fall into this rabbit hole to, to, to analyze and understand, you know, how conspiracy theories work and why uh, you know, scientists can't subscribe to these conspiracy theories because they're just in total conflict with the way scientific evidence is normally uh, uh, used. Let me, let me give you an example that, well, a couple examples that I find really 
illuminating when we talk about that. Um, the first one is the, the turning the absence of evidence into evidence for a conspiracy theory. Sure. There was a case recently, well, a few months ago this year, in the context of COVID, where some person on YouTube made the claim that, you know, this, this virus is a Chinese biological weapon and uh, it was uh, created by some lab in, in Wuhan and that the, the, that famous epidemiologist Fauci in the United States, you may have heard of him. Mm -hmm. He's all over the news. Yeah. He's, he's sort of the, the godfather of epidemiology in the United States. Oh, Fauci had, had connection to that lab and, and he sent millions of taxpayer dollars to that lab to develop this virus. Um, now it's a crazy, you know, it's crazy talk, frankly, you know, we shouldn't waste any time on that. Except what's very interesting in this case is that the person was asked to provide evidence for that. You know, well, where's the evidence that Fauci has done this? He doesn't have access to money. How, how would he do that? And the answer was, well, there is no evidence. That's the whole point. The right. cover-up is so good mm -hmm. that they're hiding their traces and there is no evidence. Now, now that's a remarkable uh, uh, thought process, if you think about it, because that's saying, I have a hypothesis that is zero, that has zero support in evidence. Therefore, it must be true. Well, the the other thing you now, sometimes you sometimes hear, and actually, uh, shockingly, I heard this. I, I I watch a lot of American politics. I heard this from either a congressperson or a senator in the last month or so. That uh, that runs along uh, alongside what you've just explained is when people say, "Well, where's the evidence for that?" and they say, "Well, where's the evidence it didn't happen?" You know, they, they, that's the other line that often conspiracy theorists will take. Um, I had a conversation with my lovely flat earth friends the other day and I explained how if, if the ice wall around the outside of the world is Antarctica, yet Antarctica is in daylight for 24 hours a day for three months of the year, then the whole world, whole flat disk would be in daylight because that's how light travels and tens of thousands of people witness this every year because there are tours to Antarctica. And straight away, the answer, well, the first answer was, uh, that doesn't happen. And the second answer was, yeah, but have they been into space and seen the moon? I mean, seen the, seen the globe for themselves. So it was a, the, there was first a massive change. And like, we, we'll leave that point that you've just made aside because I can't argue. We'll, we'll change the sure. point to something else. But then it's also sure. often there's no evidence it hasn't happened or it doesn't happen. And, you know, as, as I guess most people will be aware of, it's very difficult yeah. to prove, prove a negative. Yeah, of course. Yes, of course. You know, I mean, I can just confabulate something, a hallucination, and I can say, you know, there's a pink elephant in the corner over there. And, 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 uh, and then I can say, well, you can't prove to me it's not there. Therefore yeah. it is there. Yeah. You know, that's sort of, oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of many, I I think the point illogical I, fallacy. I think the point you made, which is really, really, really important for us to to hear, and I've heard this recently, is um, in fact I heard it listening to a debate online between a Christian and an atheist, and it was the atheist who said to the Christian, um, "The and you've been saying it, but I just want to reiterate to people listening and watching how important this is that the absence of my evidence doesn't mean that what you're saying is true." Like, if I can't prove or I don't have the evidence to suffice your question, it doesn't mean your question, therefore, is right. Sure, because they're, they're completely unconnected, yeah. I guess. Is, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think often uh, in these conversations as well, the conspiracy conversations, people look for evidence, sure. or as we've been saying earlier, they look for proof, but I guess they're looking for evidence for something to be, and if they can't be handed it, they go, well, there, see, told you, told you. That's a, but the absence of that doesn't necessarily mean you're right. Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's yes, that's one of many uh, 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 fallacies. The other one that I like is incoherence. I don't know if you've come across that, but most uh, conspiracy theories, and for that matter, science denial, is incoherent. Um, so let me give you one example, again, with COVID. That's a real example that was quite, uh, um, you know, intriguing. Again, on YouTube, some... Uh, some video making claims about uh, COVID. And the same person initially said, well, actually, COVID has been with us since we were children. 
And we got this virus through vaccinations. Oh, God. And the reason we're now having COVID <laughs> is because it was triggered by us wearing masks. Now, that's, of course, you know, nonsense one, two, and three. <laughs> There's nothing, you know, absolutely zero validity to any of this. But a few minutes later, the same person said, oh, well, you know, COVID was a chemical weapon or a biological weapon that was released by a Chinese lab in January of this year by accident. And it's kind of like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, either the, the first nonsense is true or the second nonsense. Now, of course, neither is true. But the thing is, um, you can't believe both at the same time because they're mutually incompatible. And that, I think, is very important to recognize because that is something that tells you or anybody who's now listening or anybody who's encountering a conspiracy theorist, that is a hint, a very strong cue that tells you that that person cannot be right. Whatever they're saying, something is wrong because it can't be incoherent. And you see that in science denial. Let me give you an example from climate denial, one of my favorite uh, uh, examples. Uh, we've actually incidentally cataloged about 250 inconsistencies or incoherent attitudes among climate deniers. Um, the one that, that I like the best is somebody saying, oh, well, you know, we don't even know what the global temperature is because we can't measure it. You know, these thermometers are just not reliable enough. You know, we, we, we don't, you know. Uh, and then a second later, they say, oh, but by the way, don't worry about global warming because it's been cooling for the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, well, how do you know that if you yeah. can't measure temperature, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> That's completely incoherent. And yet people will say that, that that sort of they'll, they'll juxtapose completely incoherent ideas without um, with, without detecting the incoherent. Yeah. I... And that's inevitable, because if you're denying well-established science, you cannot do that and be coherent, because if there were a coherent alternative, the scientists would have proposed it. They would be debating it. Um, but these are sort of markers of flawed cognition that is motivated rather than evidence-driven. And once you understand that as a member of the public, you at least have a, have a tool to, to sift the noise from, from the signal. It also makes me think as well, if it's a cognition issue, that it, it actually, the way you've described it, it, it gives me a sense of more empathy towards these people who, are, who aren't able to then make the leap for their own own good one of the things i was going to say to you was um so i mean covid's a good example right and it's very pertinent the science is there and the science is as good as it's doing at the moment is there to help us help us beat this thing help us get through this thing so those who are denying it who are fighting against it are actually harming themselves and yes. or potentially harming themselves i mean we're very lucky and others you're, yeah, ve very true, very true. But one of the things that I'm fascinated with is that belief, whatever it is. And I've, I've been sitting here thinking as you've been talking, because I often think religion has a big part to play in this. And, and I grew up Catholic, so often when I think religion, I think of sort of the Christian uh, belief. And I was thinking, because quite often you can think about these things and lay them at the feet of, of, of Christians as well. But actually, I know lots of people who are Christians who are completely on board with climate change and so actually it feels like the religion thing is actually less relevant to again the free market thing because it's the conservative yeah. christians that are in this field not christians and i imagine i don't know too much about any other exactly. religions no, but, there, there, but yeah there is data on that and on on how religion affects uh, uh climate attitudes and it's not at all straightforward. Um, you know, there, there is a whole Christian tradition of stewardship for the earth. And the Pope uh, um, published a, a, an encyclical, whatever it's called, a couple of years ago, where, where he made that point, you know, that we have to take climate change seriously because of our duty to, to care for the earth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, religion is, is a, um, a very mixed bag, and, and I, I wouldn't necessarily identify that as a, a – it's also uh, true for, for COVID. But let me let me let me talk a bit more about COVID and and the uh, yeah yeah just um, just to jump back sorry just to jump back to that question sure. I was going to ask which is about when the science is there to help us and our beliefs 
harm us, potentially harm us, and as you say, harm people around us, that seems even yeah. a, in a bigger step to going, I'm going to stick with my beliefs. COVID's a good example. Sure. I mean, we hear about, right. in the religious world, we hear about people, you know, not wanting to give their children blood transfusions and that sort of thing. But but right. maybe we sit with COVID because it is so relevant at the moment. But it's like voting against your own self-interest. You know, it's like, I will choose to stick with what this person has told me. That becomes my belief. I'm in the free market sector of society. I'm not going to wear a mask. Oh, granddad just died. Yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah, let's talk about that. Because first of all, we have to establish that people who are um, who believe in COVID related conspiracy theories are less likely to comply with uh, social distancing measures and other guidelines and mask wearing and all that. Of course, it's, it's unsurprising. But but yes, that has been established in a number of studies and, and is very, uh, very clear. Um, so the question then is, what, what's going on here? Why are people engaging in these conspiracy theories? And this brings me to another trigger for this kind of motivated cognition, which isn't ideology or worldview, um, but is people's feeling of uncertainty and loss of control. And one of the things that we know or that we have observed over, over centuries, actually, is that a pandemic will always trigger um, a sense of loss of control. People will um, feel that, you know, they can't control their future. They're scared. They're uncertain. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. But that's appropriate. And whenever... I mean, that's, the, that's the appropriate response because they have no control and they can't control their future. Exactly. So that's actually exactly. the correct response. Exactly. Well, I mean, having that feeling is completely understandable. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. You know, it is, it is, this is nasty. This is not something we signed up for. We didn't sort of kind of say, Hey, let's make 2020 a Corona year. Yeah. <laughs> um, that wasn't really what we signed up for. But the, the, the question then is how do you respond to that? How do you deal with with that uncertainty, what can you do? And it turns out that for a certain number of people, um, that loss of control and uncertainty is a trigger for them to engage in conspiracy theories. And that happens with pandemics with alarming regularity. It also happens with other traumatic events. Uh, any mass shooting in the US is followed by conspiracy theories. When Princess Diana died in a car crash, that triggered conspiracy theories because it was a frightening, uncontrolled, random event that, that gave people that unsettling feeling and also grief, you know, over, over the loss of this uh, beautiful woman and, and all the mystique that went with her. Um, and whenever that happens, pe some people resort to conspiracy theories. And they do that because it gives them comfort. And this is an ironic a consequence of belief in conspiracy theories that you can then explain the world as being bad because of bad people. And somehow that's more comforting than to accept that something can happen at random. Mm. You know, COVID was caused in all likelihood by some bat in a cave sneezing on a dude. And all of a sudden, you know, the society is turned upside down because of that. No, I'm comfortable to, you know, accepting that. Or, I mean, that's our best guess. Something like that happened in China. I'm comfortable with that. That happens. And in fact, it happens all the time and we should have known and we should have been prepared, et cetera, et cetera. But for other people, that's a very frightening thing to accept. They'd much rather say that um, <coughs> Bill Gates is trying to implant yeah. microchips off. into our head. Yeah. Um, because then you can blame it on Bill Gates. And the moment you can blame it on a person, you, you, you have this weird sense of empowerment because you can at least imagine that that person might not be bad and then the world would be a better place. I, so, so there is some literature that suggests that having enemies and, and having conspiracy theories with bad people at the core of it, that, that provides some sort of chicken soup for the soul, some sort of comforting uh, uh, comfort. I wonder as well because we're a um, we're a species who likes a narrative. You know, 
we have our art, we have our storytelling, you know, we, we, we like a movie that yeah. wraps up well at the end. So therefore, when we come to that moment in our lives where it is uncontrollable and unknowable, we fill it with a story. And that story is the conspiracy theory. In other words, we need something to explain the yeah. situation as to what's going on. It's uncontrollable and unexplainable. So it's like I'm watching a, a, a program on uh, Netflix at the moment called The Curse of Oak Island. And it's these guys looking for uh, treasure and all these stories about this treasure that could be buried on Oak Island. And, and I notice very clearly everything they find and everything they see points towards the treasure. Now, if you didn't know there was treasure there, it would just be a rock or it would just be a, a spent cartridge from the 1800s because obviously there was people living there. But they find stuff, and when they find it, they're like, well, this is really interesting, and this points towards the story being true. They, so because they have that that mindset you talked about before, the motivated cognition, they're looking for what they know now and what they find from there on in to point back to them finding this treasure on this island. Similar sort of thing, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that show, but it sounds sounds like it's fun. I mean, you know, to be honest, <clears throat> uh, talking about this does have some entertainment value. I mean, it's not like that that this is completely boring. Um, <clears throat> how and and that, in fact, to be honest, is is almost the problem because I think quite a few people out there are looking at the stuff and these various conspiracy theories, and they they get a chuckle out of it, and then they forward it to their friends and say, "Ha ha ha! Look over here." Um, the problem with that is that 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 makes it more visible, yeah. and the more visible you make these conspiracy theories, the more likely it is that people get entrapped in them, and that they they sort of say, "Oh, you know, that could be right." And then, you know, you you get into this community, into this cult, which is really what it is. You know, the psychology of cults and the psychology of conspiracy theorists is is quite can be quite similar. Uh, for for the hardcore committed uh, conspiracy theorists, and so yeah, and and the moment people are in that situation, it is it it has quite considerable negative consequences for themselves, but also for their loved ones. They're now, um, you know, there's there's there are increasing reports of people whose relatives are caught up in one of these conspiracy theories, and and. For them, it's a tragic loss because they can no longer communicate yeah. uh, with with those people. Because yeah. in the extreme case, you know, they're in this bubble that is just completely disconnected from reality and and interpret it you now in a completely different line. I I also discovered, um, and, and you've you've sort of touched on this already. Um, you know, some as you say, it's it's a bit of fun. It can be a bit of fun. Some conspiracy theories are fun and they're fun to talk about. I mean, it doesn't really harm anyone in the world. I don't think if you one doesn't believe that the moon landing happened, even the flat Earth one on some levels, it's not really a big deal. But I then figured out that when hanging out I, i've had two fat verses on the podcast that's why i sort of have i'm in some facebook um, groups and stuff um but then i found out we had a a tragic massacre here in new zealand where 51 people were gunned down by a um a, a right-wing white neo-national um, oh of course God, in christchurch yeah. Yeah, yeah and then all of a sudden those same people who believed that there's no moon there was no landing the earth flat they then flipped into and this is this is a, a shooting done by the government. This is a false flag operation. And I was just like, exactly. okay, that's the, whoa, fuck, hang on. This is yeah. one step too far. And then as you say, they're the ones who then yeah. don't believe in COVID and vaccinations. And it's almost exactly. like, you know, in the, in the, in the days that have gone past, they used to, used to talk about it's a gateway drug. It's like, okay, so the flat earth and the moon landing is a gateway conspiracy theory to um, not believing in COVID and taking it into the rest home where your granddad is. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of evidence to support what you just said, which is that if if somebody believes in one conspiracy theory, that is a very strong predictor that they also believe in other conspiracy theories. Um, so absolutely, you know, once once you're in this cluster, uh, chances are that there will be other theories that that people believe because um, you know they they <laughs> for some people, not everybody. But for some people, uh, conspiracy theories are, are something that, you know, they're predisposed to believe that because of their cognitive style and their predisposition towards, 
you know, magical thinking or relying on intuition as an indicator of truth rather than evidence. You know, if you ask people these questions, you, you sometimes get very surprising answers. Like, mm. oh, you know, it feels right to me, therefore it has to be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, believe and believe that's more your senses. To me. You know, it's a sort of feeling based uh, uh, cognition. So, yeah, totally. That, that, <laughs> there, there's no doubt that these attitudes cluster together. Now, one thing about that is another thing I want to add is that fortunately, I guess, fortunately, uh, not everybody who articulates a conspiracy theory is in fact that committed to it and, and is one of those people who will believe every conspiracy that's out there. Um, and I've got some research underway where I show that. And basically what, what I show in one of my studies is that you can trigger conspiratorial rhetoric uh, in people who are not predisposed to conspiracies by creating a situation where, where things challenge their worldview. In other words, um, people who, who are libertarians, again, and who are challenged by climate change, they will resort to conspiratorial explanations of the scientific consensus because it allows them to get off the hook. They could just yeah, right. make a throwaway comment. Oh, the scientists are in it for the money. Yeah, right. Okay. And then right, right, right. That, that means I can fly to Bali on my next holiday. Um, but the same people wouldn't do that when it comes to explaining the scientific consensus on other issues such as AIDS, HIV and AIDS. You know, the, 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 sure, if you're a conspiracy theorist, Theorist, you'll deny that link, but it's not triggered by uh, your libertarianism in the way it is for climate change. So there is a very selective use of conspiratorial rhetoric that people engage in basically to get off the hook right. because they don't then have to accept the scientific evidence. Now, the reason I think that's conceivably good news is because we know it is extremely difficult to deal with people who are deep down the conspiratorial rabbit hole because they will interpret any evidence in favor of the theory, no matter what it says, they will not listen to, to you know, government sources, official sources, scientific evidence. They're not interested in that. So they're extremely difficult to reach. But that doesn't mean everybody who articulates a conspiracy theory is that difficult to reach. There's a lot of people who deploy that just because it's kind of you know, it's a throwaway comment. And we have data to suggest that. We have data to suggest that actually, um, you know, in, in many cases, you can convince people otherwise. Not everybody is immune to evidence. And I think that's uh, important to sort of uh, close on that. We're, we're sort of running out of time a bit. Um, yeah, look, let, me, that, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, Professor. Um, it's exactly sure. what I was going to say. We've only got maybe three or four minutes left. But those sure. of us who are sitting on the outside um, and have gone past the fact of, oh, look at these silly COVID deniers and actually going, these guys are really in danger and they're putting their families in danger and, and, and us in danger on some level. What can we do when you've mm -hmm. got, when, when we believe the science and they have a personal ideology or belief, how do you cut through that and... and I don't know if you can even convince them, but get them to understand what the the truth is and maybe what they're missing um, to for, for their own sake and the sake of everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good point. I mean, I think uh, first of all, you you got to pick your audience and you got to know who you're talking to. I tend not to talk to people who are conspiracy theorists or climate deniers because you know what's the point? I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in convincing them. They, you know, that 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 is not my goal. My goal is to talk to as many people as possible who are not susceptible to, to falling into these traps and to explain to them why there are these people out there who ha have those beliefs, how you can tell that those beliefs are flawed just based on their incoherence, for example, and thus to protect uh, the, the large majority of the public uh, against falling for nonsense. That, that I think, to, to my mind is the most important communicative effort we can expend is to talk to the people who just have to be backed up a little and, and are, you know, given some support mm. and, and they're actually okay, but we just got to strengthen their, 
their belief in themselves that they're able to resist the these illogical and incoherent conspiracy theories. So, so that, for starters, I think is crucial. I think uh, I, I think that's an idea that goes really well when we're talking about society. You know, like we don't debate, yeah. like don't debate the deniers, don't do this, don't do that. But like, if it's yeah. and, it, and I don't have anyone in my family like this, but if it was my brother, and if I had a vested interest right. in them, if it was yeah. a, sure. a, a parent of mine who was ignoring it, so they're going out without masks. So we do have a vested interest. Do you have any advice in that kind of area as well? Well, again, that's when it becomes that's when it becomes much more complicated if you're personally involved with the person who holds these beliefs and who is engaging in actions that are harmful to themselves or others. Um, well, then, you know, it, again, it depends on, on who that person is and how far they are down the rabbit hole and committed to this. If they're an extreme case and they're committed to this theory and it's part of their identity and you're threatening their identity whenever you try to talk them out of it, then you're not going to be very successful and you may be in for a very painful experience. Mm. And, and you know, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it may end up that your relationship suffers with, with people like that. There's enough evidence to suggest that that, that does happen. You know, uh, the family of cult members, there's a lot of literature on that, that they suffer a great deal because they effectively lose a person uh, who, who's, you know, when they, when they go too far down this rabbit hole. So um, I, I can't offer much, <laughs> you know, solace. However, there, there is a gray zone in between before people become so extremely committed where uh, what the research suggests is that, that you can still have a conversation with these people and, and uh, you know, the literature on, on de-radicalization of extremists and terrorists suggests that it's a long-term process. You got to build a rapport. You got to show empathy. You got to be, you know, sympathetic to the fact that they, you know, gee, that's interesting. You're holding these beliefs. Hey, you know, why don't we both go on a journey of discovery and look at the evidence right. together? You know, that sort of approach um, is is known to be more successful than uh, confrontation. So walking with um, rather than confronting at the, you know, confront. Walking yeah, I mean, with a total kind of like, you're an idiot, and how could anybody believe <laughs> that? And, you know, you know, that doesn't, people don't like to be told that. It's kind of weird, you know. It's kind of funny that they don't respond well to that. And, but and, by the same token, you also can't agree with them. So you have to find a way to negotiate this territory and to say, yeah. well, you know, I respect that people can come to different beliefs, but, you know, why don't we go on this, journey of discovery together and and uh, um, then over time if you can invest the time there there is an opportunity for success but it's not going to be easy all right unfortunately i, I think uh, so it sounds like what you're saying is some people are beyond that approach and the best idea is to get to people before they get to a get so tribal that in their beliefs crucial because we get so Indeed. tribal in our beliefs that we're never going to let them go no matter what and I, as I said a couple of times basically me having fun with some flat earthers I've seen that and actually if I now think about if that person was a family member and it was we were talking about vaccines that would be a much scarier proposition so yeah getting them before they're down that final final rabbit hole and walking alongside them rather than confronting them uh, as an idiot I think that's the best that's the best we can do Hey, Professor Stephen Lewandowski, okay. uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I've thank enjoyed you. it immensely, and hopefully for people out there, this has been somewhat useful. Um, all the way from Berlin, thank you for joining us. I guess we say Auf Wiedersehen, don't we? Okay, yeah, or tschüss. That's the colloquial. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. All right, team, that's us. Hope you enjoyed that. We'll be back Monday night. If you're a patron, I am recording this Thursday afternoon. If you're a patron, there is a chance that I'm going to upload a video of a conversation with Byron that I'm planning to have tonight onto the patrons only page. Uh, so thank you for being a patron. And um, yeah, Byron, Byron C. Clark, you know, you know what I'm talking about um, to do with conspiracies it, it fits in quite beautifully actually and i'm if i if i've managed to do that recording which i'm planning on doing then i will upload it to the patrons only so you patrons might get a special little uh nugget on friday 
which is a chat that I'm planning on having with Byron tonight in the car as I'm dropping him home. That's the plan. Will it happen? Well, we shall see. Um, so if you are a patron, thanks for being on board. You are one of the reasons we're able to do this. It takes a little bit of pressure off some other things that we have to do and pay some bills. Every five bucks makes a huge difference. Uh, so thank you for being involved. If you like what we do, if you enjoy the content that BHN puts out, then the way you can be involved to help us out is to get onto patreon.com forward slash big hairy news and if you are a patron reminder there is a saturday morning meetup if you're not yet a patron and you can't become a patron before saturday morning then you'll get the link as well to come and join us for an online catch-up saturday morning 11 a.m new zealand time all right tim i hope you enjoyed that podcast it's a, a looking back on it now it seems more relevant as ever today than it was two years ago when i said it's more relevant than ever so hopefully you enjoyed that and we will catch you for a regular broadcast of big hairy news on monday night from 9 p.m and so then say safe through the week uh, thank you for being involved and we